welcome. Um, especially welcome to Oksana Duczak. Um, she's here from Ukraine, which is maybe, I would say, like for me, a country where I wouldn't have uh, located the textile, the garment industry, like in Eastern Europe. Um, and she is a researcher in the Center for Social and Labor Research in Ukraine, a sociologist by training. And uh, she recently uh, completed or is, complete, is uh, in the process of completing a research on the working conditions in the garment factory in Ukraine um, for Clean Clothes campaign and also Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. And we decided we wanted to, that we will talk a bit about this research, how you do it, how you did it, uh, what you found out, um, and um, what the working conditions in the garment factories and the garment industry in, in Ukraine look like. And um, as before, you guys are welcome to uh, join the discussion. So you can just raise your hands if you have any questions. If you don't want to, uh, me to answer questions, you can like just take over. Um, my name is Wenke Christoph. I'm um, senior advisor with the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, working on Southeast Europe actually, where there's also textile and shoe industry being built up in several countries. And maybe, Oksana, you could um, start with a bit of an introduction, like the, the textile industry in Ukraine, how important is it? Is it just a couple of factories, or is it like a major part of the industry there? Um, yes, <laughs> uh, good evening, and thank you for invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here and to listen contribution of other people and to make a chance to publicize a little bit our own situation. Um, so, um, in Ukraine, is it okay? <laughs> Sorry, so, like that. Um, uh, so generally, for me, it was totally a new topic when I started to research. And I also had an image that it's only like in Asian countries such things happening, both productions and conditions, which are faced by workers. Uh, so for me, it was also a total discovery. Uh, and in generally, I can say that there are um, many, uh, several distinctions between um, Asian countries and Ukraine, for example. And uh, there are several similarities, um, which are unfortunate similarities, like working conditions and very low payment. But in general, what I can say, so there are many brands producing in Ukraine. Uh, in totally, I would say there are, uh, officially there are around, around 2,000 um, um, factories which are producing garment and shoes in Ukraine. Uh, but taking into account that a huge share of economy is informal, uh, we estimated around 6,000 factories, uh, if we take the share of informality. Um, officially, there are 72,000 people working on these factories, uh, and we estimate the real numbers are somewhere like um, 220,000 uh, um, 220, uh, workers working in the industry. Um, if we're trying to evaluate its importance, it's quite hard because there is no even official statistic on GDP contribution uh, of the industry, unfortunately and strangely. Um, but uh, the share of export of this uh, industry um, into in Ukrainian ec economy in export in general um, is around um, to uh, up to three uh, percent like of the total export so it's not like the bangladesh uh, or some other asian countries or like where its share is very big but still it's uh, an important um, uh, part of the economy taken into account like to um, uh, to southern uh, 20 hundred uh, to 220,000 um, yeah. <laughs> <Working. laughs> uh, of workers working in the sector. It's uh, as you often uh, mainly women working, so it's also the question of gender equality and gender pay gap, uh, which we are facing. And um, should I take into the conditions and main, maybe like yeah. <laughs> maybe one short question: Is it like are these companies like newly? Newly in, new investments, new foreign investments, or is it mainly um, like local companies? Mm -hmm. um, 
so the story is that um, uh, this garment and shoe sector was very well developed during Soviet times. Ukraine was one of the main uh, producers among Soviet republics of uh, garment and shoes. Uh, but after the Union collapsed, um, the sector started to decrease rapidly. Uh, a lot of factories went bankrupted uh, because um, the internal market collapsed because of the um, trans uh, transition to <laughs> market economy, people, uh, the power to grow rapidly and people just couldn't allow to buy new clothes. And um, it's still like this now, I would say. And the, the whole system, the whole chain of production collapsed because in Soviet time, for example, there were a fabric produced in Uzbekistan and it was transported to Ukraine, for example, and it was made into clothes and mm -hmm. uh, so on. So um, a lot of factories were closed and the share of this production decreased very rapidly. And already in late 90s, um, some factories, so they started to privatize factories by Ukrainians mainly. Uh, and uh, already in 90s, some factories started to take orders from Western brand, uh, brands. And those factories mostly were um, in a profitable position and they could survive the crisis because like, they had profit and they could keep their workforce. Uh, so it's like this, and now it's mainly um, Ukrainian-owned private factories, uh, which are producing, f uh, making orders for Western brands. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then maybe let's go the next step into the question of the working conditions, like from the, the whole overview of the industry to the working conditions. That was the, the, the focus of your research, as I understand. And um, when we talked before, you said that this was maybe one of the first works, actually, of the last years on working conditions in the garment, fact, uh, garment industry in Ukraine. Yes. Uh, when I was approaching the research, I mean, I wanted to find some entry points, like some reference, where should I look for those factories? So I was heavily researching the internet, like Googling, and uh, both for journalistic and scholarly articles. Um, I could hardly find many, like most of the uh, Ukrainian scholarly articles uh, on the topic are very general, very poor quality, and they barely speak about uh, labor uh, issue. So they can speak about share of export, about organization of production, but not about um, uh, working conditions and payment in the sector. There were several journalistic articles. One of them was very good um, in t for me, like for, for to start a research, because it mentions particular fa factories and particular brands which were producing on those factories. Uh, but it also, uh, like, there are several journalistic articles and they appeared from time to time, uh, but uh, it, they barely touch the issue of labor. Sometimes they mention that labor is cheap and that's why the investor comes here. But it's all like they don't speak to <laughs> uh, to people, and mm -hmm. like they don't have an image of what how harsh are those mm -hmm. conditions uh, in Ukrainian factories. How how then did you like approach the issue? Like like did you did you like start to like Google where are the textile factories, and then like try to go there, or did you go like via like did you approach them via maybe unions or so? So <laughs> how did you end up at the factories um, to talk to people? Yeah, the, my first reference point was this very good journalistic article. So at least I had a map of few factories, which were most likely producing for brands for particular brands. And uh, I was trying to, first of all, uh, to find some contacts on these factories, asking people who are from those cities, like whether they know somebody who are uh, working on the factory. It was fruitless, totally. <laughs> uh, it appears like, and that was my first um, insight, that there is some kind of um, a class bubble, like that um, my Facebook friends say, I can easily get a contact of owner of the factory or a main accountant of the factory, a main engineer of the factory, but they barely know somebody who works there as a worker. And so this route was misleading, like we couldn't do it 
in this way, uh, we try to find some trade unions, and there is a big federation of trade unions still from Soviet time, but um, from my background, I know what kind of union it is. It is a yellow union, mostly. Uh, and uh, so, honestly, we didn't even try to contact them, and uh, um, as a result, show it was a good decision, because um, on those factories where there was uh, a union, of this kind, uh, it did nothing, and I mean, <laughs> no labor struggle or struggle for labor rights. So we just approached the factories and started to talk with people, like, so near the factories, but on the distance, so like the management couldn't see us, like on a bus stop or something. And uh, it was hard, but uh, at the end it worked, and we could manage to get uh, the needed, uh, the requested number of interviews for the factories. Mm -hmm. So maybe give us like the highlights. What did you find out about the working conditions? Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, it appears that. Oh, is it the low lights? Like we can decide. Yeah, it was a big discovery for me because um, it is hard um, for, for personally for myself, but I have to. We have to recognize that these working conditions are unfortunately not far from classical sweatshops. We know from. Uh, Naomi Klein book and from other other many many projects. Uh, for me, it was a discovery. Like I didn't know things like this was happening in Ukraine, and our research covers only uh, factories in formal economy, like in uh, so legal factories which which are there, which are supposedly checked by labor inspections and so on. Uh, so I can only imagine what happens on illegal factories and in, in, in a shadow economy, informal economy. And the thing is, uh, like the biggest issue which is there is uh, overtime, uh, very insecure uh, employment in terms, I mean, uh, they all are employed formally on these factories. They have a um, social uh, pack, a social insurance of a kind, like which is uh, required by the law. But at the same time, uh, we came to a situation when we know that uh, when they have uh, a lot of orders on the factory, usually it's in summer, when the uh, temperature on the factory can be up to 40 degrees, and uh, they, should, they stay to work there like 10 to 12 hours per day, six days per week, sometimes till morning, if they have an urgent uh, order and they have to finish it urgently. Um, so it was the main problem, this uh, very harsh overtime hours. At the same time, when there were no orders, which usually happens in winter and in spring, uh, they were basically forced to use part of their legally, uh, legal um, annual leave, like so they uh, can have an annual leave of 24 days per year by law, and they were forced to take it not when they, so they, uh, they had to take it not when they want to, which is usually in summer, but they had to take it in winter, in spring, because there were no orders. And just the owner basically forced them to take this annual leave. So the, it was a situation of some kind of swing between the uh, full load and a lot of production and harsh overtime hours and between times when they, there was no job uh, to do and they were forced to leave the factory for a while. And uh, another thing that this overtime is not paid properly, like totally, not even according to Ukrainian law. And the uh, third, which, I, which is probably the first in terms of importance, is a very low payment. So the wages are extremely low. Um, they are on on the um, among people whom we uh, interviewed, the average wage is 96 euro per month, which is uh, one and a half times lower than average wage in this industry in Ukraine. <laughs> So, I mean, the average wage in uh, light industry, which includes garment and shoe sector, is 135 euro. But on these factories, which are producing, which are in better position, actually, and are producing for foreign brands, uh, it's one and, a, one and a half times lower. It is twice lower than in economy in average. And it is four times lower than the highest, uh, the most... Um, 
uh, four times lower than the highest average wage in uh, process manufacturing. So it is a very small wage. Uh, it is very typical uh, because in Ukraine the uh, living wage, which is uh, not the, the legal minimum wage in Ukraine, is 89 euros. And it is also extremely small. And basically the owner of the factory is legally obliged only to pay this amount, which is critically small. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they pay more, but in the end it appears not much more than the legal minimum wage. So it was the biggest, uh, it is the biggest problem in the sector. What would you say is uh, the reason why the wages in the, especially in the textile industry is so low, especially if you compare it to other light industries or, and like, I would say like, like conventional theory would say that like especially in foreign invested companies where there's like I don't know codes of conduct, corporate social responsibilities, uh, you would expect the wages to be higher. But actually, what you found out is um, is that they are lower than the average. Well, on uh, the first, I think well, the first is a structural problem of this global uh, global production chains. When, okay, nobody is obliged to pay more than is required by the uh, national law. On the other hand, uh, taking the, the um, issue of brands, the, prob the big problem is that uh, a big part of this uh, garment production, uh, these factories which produce for Western brands, they are not the first level subcontractors. So when you research the export destination of Ukrainian garment sector, the biggest one is Germany, which is 37%, uh, uh, which is most likely the direct orders from brands. But then goes Hungary, Romania, Poland, which is definitely a subcontracting of subcontracting. And that's where the link to the brand is getting weaker and weaker, as we all know. And maybe brands even don't know that they are producing in this factory, so they should know, of course. But yeah, it is uh, uh, the, um, the weakest, like there's a link between the policy of brand and the conditions on the factory is getting weaker and weaker further down the supply chain. Mm -hmm. So what seems to be, like developing is kind of like a network also of subcontracting in in the periphery of Europe, yes. and that is, you know, like that that is additional to the textile, the huge textile sector in Asia. And um, do you have any like do you have an, any idea why this is developing in the in the European periphery? Like, wouldn't it be cheaper and easier to produce everything in Cambodia, Bangladesh, India, or like is there a specific demand to have, you know, like textile industry close to the European core, to the customers? Yeah, the first thing is uh, probably logistic, but uh, it is also uh, the additional thing is uh, cheap labor, which is also cheap in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, different in different countries, but in case of Ukraine it is like Sometimes, uh, as I checked, it is sometimes lower than in some Asian countries, like where brands are producing, mm -hmm. which is definitely a very powerful reason uh, for brands to locate the industry here. Mm -hmm. So I think like this. So maybe then going um, like going a third step in our conversation, then the question is, where do you see potentials and possibilities for labor organizing in in the textile industry in in Ukraine is for example that like the the situation that these factories are close to Europe maybe they order like it's like this order on demand system where they have to you know supply very quickly what is ordered then maybe this opens up a specific like also strategic possibility for strikes for labor organizing to like say okay the there are vulnerable supply chains they depend on they depend on just in time production and quick uh, quick supplies so maybe if you strike you can use that advantage uh, yes, it could be, but for to, to for this strategy to work, workers first have to know about that advantage, mm. which they some I think often don't. I mean, it is very hard uh, to explain to them. We are not uh, included into this all consumption production discourse. Uh, I mean, yet. 
hopefully it will be at some point. And workers themselves, they, if you even try to explain them, okay, at some point they will understand the logic of what we are doing and what they can do, but it's still like a big problem. It's not like obvious, it's not out there in the public discourse in Ukraine, and like it's not very, very easy for them to get this information on the one hand. On the other hand, um, it's, uh, we, we at least uh, could get information about a case of prosecution of uh, repressions against uh, attempts to create an independent union. So it is another problem. Uh, when people were just fired right after they started to claim higher wages. <laughs> and um, we definitely know about one case and we have some information about another case when people uh, started um, to strike and they were also fired immediately. And it is also a huge problem. Another problem is the uh, yellow unions, which um, and the whole um, heritage of trade unionism in Ukraine, which was heavily discredited during Soviet time, when it became just another management uh, position in Ukraine and in all Soviet Union countries. So on those factories we researched, um, like, okay, we researched four factories, more or less, like uh, five, one, uh, five uh, additional was a case of repression against the union. So two of them had trade union, but it, uh, it was a trade union. Uh, so you apply for a job, you're hired, and you automatically become a member of a trade union. <laughs> and those unions, they do nothing, basically. Uh, because uh, on one factory, when uh, there was the worst situation among the researched factories, when people even didn't uh, receive a legal minimum wage, which is totally against the Ukrainian law, <laughs> and there was a union on that factory, but <laughs> it didn't, it couldn't influence, I mean, it didn't have a will to influence the situation, but just a pocket union. So that's another problem. So first of all, people, uh, this discourse should be there. So people can easily relate themselves to this discourse and to the idea that it's not only the owner, it's like the whole network of suppliers, suppliers or directly the brand who is responsible and who can be pressed for, the, for an issue. And that it works and in some cases and that it should be like the strategy should be applied and tested. I, like, we were thinking, like, for this two days with Bettina and having some other conversation with you, like, what can be done to start, at least, and we were thinking that the first step should be a publication of the research in Ukraine, because we had some presentations and so on, but it should be published and maybe some press releases made, so um, some may, uh, I, I hope and uh, I suspect some journalists will become interested in this, and this information will be out there somewhere. Then we can meet some, uh, through this way, we can meet some organizations who are also interested in the topic, because now I barely knew any, but I suspect there should be at least some. And after that, like building such a network of at least several organizations or interested people and journalists, we can, uh, it would be easier to reach to workers, basically. Maybe like you joined the, like you took part in most of the event here and um, one of the questions that is discussed for the, like that was discussed in the evening and in the afternoon already is also like what can we do maybe in a, on a transnational level or maybe as consumers, as activists or like, you know, politically interested people also here in Germany or in other countries. Do you see any possibilities of solidarity, like transnational solidarity also for labor struggles in Ukraine? Uh, I think that the whole um, strategies, all the set of strategies which are used by Clean and Closes, Clean Closes campaign and other activist organization, it's very useful and in terms, uh, what I uh, hope for is that at some point, like there would be a kind of situation when uh, these strategies can be applied at least at once and it will create a case like which will be a sh which can be used as a showcase for ge for general public discourse in Ukraine and for workers precisely so they will see that this kind of strategy exists that this kind of network exists and it can work like and i think that would be the most uh, first important step which can 
start the snowball of, I hope, <laughs> of some kind of progress in this uh, situation. Okay, thanks. I'll look now to you guys. Do you have any questions to Oksana? Mm -hmm -hmm. Not really at the moment. Yeah. yeah. I would be interested. Thanks for your very presentation. First of all, I would be interested to um, uh, how do you see the future development or current development of the industry? Is it uh, growing very strongly? Because I think there's a lot of uh, movement towards the Ukraine, as far as I'm aware. Do you have any findings or results? In this? Uh, so we have some statistical information, but it's a little bit, so it, um, it is publicized slowly, so it's from several years ago, like two years ago. Um, the general tendency is that uh, the employment and general like production was uh, decreasing after the crisis of 2008-2009. And now the situation of the military conflict and the economic collapse also decreased the employment, for example, in this sector, at least formal employment. Uh, whether it would be um, a good field for where the development of investment can start, it can, but now um, there is no direct indication of that. It can be, it can work, it, I mean, it can attract um, uh, foreign brands more. Uh, but it also depends on many factors, like on, I don't know, political, economic stability of Ukraine and so on. Uh, so it's complicated, it's hard to predict now, actually. But um, I, I thought, like, during the research that um, um, some owners of the factories, for example, they use a very active strategy to promote themselves like uh, both inside Ukraine and outside so that would probably work for them at some point I think especially like because uh, as I when I named uh, uh, the uh, average wage um, it's not that it was always like that it's because of the economic crisis and the devaluation of the currency and of inflation so it was not like that probably several years ago before the crisis started and this can also play uh, be a factor of attracting uh, investment and orders from uh, foreign brands but there are a lot of if like and the situation can go in different can go in different direction mm -hmm. any more questions from you guys another question <laughs> Um, uh, the thing is that uh, during Soviet times, uh, those factories were built mostly in cities or small cities, but not usually in villages as far as I know. And the current factories are actually mostly in the buildings of those Soviet factories. Some of them are still from 1927, like one factory was built in 1927. And um, a lot of people who are employed there work there from Soviet times. Like our, uh, like um, the most extreme case was the woman uh, who uh, has been working there for f fifty something years, like since she was seventeen. Like so, it was her first job, and she is still working there. Uh, so those factories are mainly in cities or small cities. Uh, in different, like, um, of this, uh, so some of them are located even in Kiev, I think, but like in capital, but not many. Uh, some in other regional centers and big cities, but also in small provincial towns. Like, uh, uh, I also had in for like find information that there are some in um, rural settlements. But as I suspect, it's mostly uh, informal uh, factories, and those factories to whom big factories in Ukraine are subcontracting also because it's also a practice which exists and yeah um, the thing like also the, the big difference between for example Asian um, uh, factories is that it's usually not young people who work there it's usually people in their mid like I don't know mid 30s 40s not like 20 something years 
Uh, some of them are like um, on retirement already, but they continue to work because pension is like ridiculous in Ukraine. It's like 43 euros per month. Uh, so they have to work somewhere and they continue to work on the factory where they have been working their whole life. So first difference is the age of the workers and second difference, there is uh, no big internal migration to these factories. Mm -hmm. So those can be people from villages, but usually nearby villages and they commute to their place, to their home every day. Like So they come and go but also people who live in those uh, cities and towns. After uh, the military conflict started, there, were, there are and there were a lot of internally displaced people from the eastern part of Ukraine, and on some factories they are also employed. And those are people who are particularly exposed to exploitation because, I mean, they usually rent an apartment. It's not their own apartment, like many people in Ukraine have their own apartment, still from Soviet time. But they lost their home, they are here, they have to rent. So they are in a harsh economic situation and so they are exposed to exploitation. And even on some factories, uh, the owners particularly targeted those people, so there were uh, local like state employment office together with owner they made a special event for internally displaced people to invite them to work on the factory but at the same time it's obvious that uh, there is no discrimination on this base they also receive the same wage they have the same conditions and yeah but the thing is that they are easily uh, not manipulated but um, uh, easily so they are more afraid to lose their job and so on. So they won't probably, they are the least likely to protest or to demand or to complain. Maybe adding to that, uh, how do people survive on these low wages? <laughs> like uh, it really, is, like, it yeah. is an important question. Like, do they, like, does everyone have his, like, farm, little garden, whatever, to, like, like get the veggies and not, to not uh, have to buy them or, like, do the families like decide, okay, you go work in garment, I go work somewhere else to try to earn some more money, or how does it work? Uh, yes, usually, um, first of all, it's of course, we can call it only survival, because it's like, um, according to cleaning cl clean clothes campaign methodology, there was a whole block of question related to living wage. So we tried to ask people, uh, these workers, how much they would need to buy food, clothes, and so on and so on. And what was striking for me, personally, and it was also a very unpleasant discovery, which I would probably suspect, but I didn't know it was such a systematic problem. For example, when we tried, uh, when we asked them to estimate the cost of, um, I don't know, going to a cinema or a restaurant, they don't know, because they never went there for last several years. Or when we ask them how much they would need for uh, their family to go on vacation somewhere to the sea or to the mountains, they don't know. And it was like, uh, when we asked them how, they, how much they would need to buy clothes, they uh, named a very small amount of money because they usually buy second-hand clothes. And uh, basically, like, one new pair of Nike shoes would amount to their salary, so their monthly wage. So it was also a huge uh, strike for me, like, personally. Uh, that this problem is so systematic. So how do they survive? It's, it's uh, very, uh, so they try to save money on everything, basically on every needs, especially, dem which is especially damaging for any cultural, for any uh, vocation, for any free time, I mean, um, uh, qu uh, qu quality, high, high quality free time. Uh, another thing is the personal gardens, which they call it gold sometimes, like gold gardens. Uh, it is very common, like in, in cities, like they have their own personal garden and they just basically have this, uh, they have a lot of products from them. It is also, if uh, they came from villages, it is also a support of uh, their family who stayed there, for example, like their parents who live still in the villages and they support them with some products, with some food. But what was the biggest uh, also discovery for me in this respect uh, is that uh, um, basically the surviving of this workforce uh, who are producing for rich Western brand is subsidized by poor Ukrainian state. 
and it was so obvious, like, so it's pensions, like age pensions for people who are retired, it's disability pensions for people who have disabilities, it's a um, subsidy for public utility payment, like which are now in Ukraine, cheap uh, public transportation in the city, uh, which is subsidized from the budget. And like, so it appears like that actually, like it's not, and these people, they work at least 40 hours per week and usually 45 hours per week and like, uh, and even more in high season. And still they have to be subsidized by the state. Otherwise, I mean, there would be no way for them to have at least some life, not even speaking of decent life. This is um, like really like. Do you have any more questions, guys? Yeah. I would like to know what are the brands, just uh, what kind of product is it high quality, low quality? Is it the typical mm -hmm. fashion retailers? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very very different brands, and many of them. Uh, I have a list. Uh, some of them you can find in official lists published by brands from those who publish that. Just a second, like Hugo Boss. C and Day, ASOS, um, sorry, um, Adidas, and so on. Uh, others we found on uh, either named by workers or stated on a um, factory web page. Okay, maybe I deleted this <laughs> information. Uh, it's like, um, what else was there? So it was S. Oliver, it was um, uh, Esprit, named at least by the factory. Um, it was, uh, uh, New Balance has a factory officially, which is uh, which supplies for them in Ukraine. Um, also, um, um, Dolce Gabbana was named by workers, Grossa Moda, um, St. James, which is a Fran French brand, uh, Kirsten, which is also, uh, as far as I remember, a French brand. Um, and many, many others. So it's those which comes to my mind when I uh, try to remember that. And yeah, so it's very, very different brand and it can be like a Hugo Boss and it can be some uh, Kirsten, which uh, I personally don't even recognize. Uh, Triumph, like German brand, mm -hmm. for example. And uh, actually the case of Triumph was the comparatively better, like the factory which produced for Triumph was comparatively better for, for some reasons, uh, structural reasons. But in general, like it's many, many brands and it, uh, I mean, it's those which we could find information. And I think there are a lot of those we cannot find or have not found yet. Okay, you point, uh, you're painting a bit of a, of course, like a quite harsh picture of the of the living conditions of the working conditions and um, do you like um, maybe as a last word or like a last couple of sentences because we have to hand over to the next point in the program um, what where, where do you see maybe also yourself after this research did it change you in a way like did it impress you in a specific way and do you think uh, like that there's a perspective of you know like supporting labor struggles as a researcher uh, it definitely changed my perspective because until now I was working with labor issues but uh, for many years I was working with uh, labor protests, but it was a statistical data like which I interpreted and it is something totally different which I do now. I was working and I'm still working with trade unions of miners and I do understand how better their position is structurally. Uh, so totally because they have an independent union, they, are, they have a structural power because they uh, are one of the main contributor to Ukrainian economy, for example, and they are organized. I mean, it's totally different structural position. So this like uh, information which I got from this research was totally new for me, both in terms of engagement like in this, like to talk with workers like and not with using like interpreting numbers and statistical data and to talk with, to talk with workers who are structurally unprivileged like one of the most structurally unprivileged workers in Ukrainian economy and I think in uh, in global economy in general 
Uh, so uh, what I hope that uh, first of all we still have some research to do but now we are intensively and I'm personally engaged in that thinking about what can be done, what should be done now and I understand it's a long, ter uh, time, a long term pro process uh, because like in Ukraine it's just you have to start from the very beginning um, having some image of the landscape but actually don't uh, seeing actors there like so we should first find whether there are actors which could be engaged and if not we should somehow think how to um, how to uh, reinforce their creation not reinforce but stimulate maybe their creation and how to change how to bring this discourse into the country and how to change the perspective of i mean it's totally uh, big scale <laughs> task which I am not which is a little bit utopian but how to change the perspective of the government the mainstream perspective that it is good we have a cheap labor because investors will come to our country and they're doing their best to promote good investment climate and they are not caring about like increasing uh, really increasing the living minimum wage they, uh, they have increased it recently, but because of inflation, it basically was not increased at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Oksana. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Sir.